Hi, I'm Greg Lefebvre, and this is The Compulsive Storyteller, a series of short, real stories that prove that truth can be stranger than fiction. In this week's episode, I share three stories about how cruel nature can be. First is Tokyo Attack with a Savage Raven. Second is Picnic, where Canada geese go on a rampage. And lastly is Scarface, about a damaged squirrel finding a happy ending. Tokyo Attack There's a feeling and a smell to a cold early morning in a big city. As I leave my hotel on a side street in downtown Tokyo, my nose burns from the air. Walking along the street, I stop to watch three big black ravens rip open a trash bag on a narrow sidewalk. They're much larger than North American crows. Their legs are spread wide and their wings are partially open to maintain their balance on the irregular trash bags that they're fiercely ripping into with their sharp black bills, forcing all the Japanese office workers hurrying to work to walk into the street to avoid the birds. I stand off to the side and watch, my breath visible in the cold morning air. Then a well-dressed woman, so annoyed at having her path blocked, simply walks in the narrow space between the ravens and a nearby building, holding her arm and hand out to fend them off. The nearest raven takes this as a provocation and attacks her arm and hand. It's a brief struggle. She flails and he pecks and claws, while everyone else on the street simply freezes. When she succeeds in pulling away from the bird, her hand is bleeding badly. Once out of range of the ravens, a few passers-by try to help her. But she simply fends them off with her bloody hand in the same way that she fended off the ravens. Then the three birds fly away. Whatever they were eating is all gone now. Picnic. I find myself hungry in the middle of Newton, Massachusetts. As I leave the McDonald's with my bag of burgers and fries, I ask a passerby where I can find a nice place to have my lunch outdoors. He directs me to the banks of the pond in front of nearby Newton City Hall. As I walk away, he says something cryptic. If you're lucky, you may get to see a real good show. Not knowing what he means, I envision teenagers making out in their cars. When I park facing forward in the City Hall lot overlooking the pond, I can see a number of picnickers sitting on their blankets at the edge of the water. Some of them also have McDonald's bags. As I look to my left and right, it seems that the people sitting in their cars on either side of me are in a state of high expectation. The scene is idyllic. It's a perfect soft summer's day outside the Georgian Revival City Hall with its Greek temple-style portico and Corinthian columns. Just the slightest breeze ruffles the water, and picnickers are lunching on the newly cut grass by the pond's edge. Then to complete this summer pastoral, a flock of Canada geese in a V formation paddles across the pond toward the picnickers. I could be looking at a 19th century John Constable English landscape painting, possibly entitled Summer's Peace. As the geese pick up speed crossing the water, some of the onlookers in the cars around me start to toot on their horns, and all eyes are on the banks of the pond. I still haven't caught on yet. The guy in the car next to me jumps out, yelling and waving his arms to warn the people of something. But he's also smiling. They all ignore him, thinking probably he's some sort of a nut job. Then things happen fast. The lead goose reaches the edge of the pond, runs up the embankment toward the nearest picnickers, with his wings spread wide and his big black bill open, hissing at his targets. The family jumps up in complete disarray. The wife and one kid tumble sideways as the big goose steals their lunch, gulping down their burgers and fries. Now I understand why the occupants of the surrounding cars were in such a state of readiness. Meanwhile, the rest of the flock make short work of the other picnickers. I can't help but laugh at this scene of pastoral carnage. As they retreat, some of the panicked picnickers still have their napkins tucked into their waistbands. A few are crying, some are smiling, and all the onlookers are laughing hysterically. 
The lead goose is now digging through one of the overturned picnic baskets, looking for more food. I drive out of the parking lot, marveling at how this serene summer scene turned into complete chaos in the wink of an eye, and appreciate a good laugh. It occurs to me that for the onlookers, this is a regular daily event. I guess that if no one was really hurt, why not just enjoy the show? Scarface. My front yard is big, and my neighbors hate me because I let the grass grow so deep it looks like a farmer's field. When I sit here to read, I'm almost invisible in the deep grass. My animal neighbors, however, love me for the refuge that my yard offers, especially the very tall old elm tree. Lost in my reading one day, there's a terrible crack, and the tree splits at its main fork, and half of it comes crashing down right next to me. From a large knothole in the fallen tree, a squirrel shepherds three of her baby squirrels to safety. A fourth baby with a bloodied face tries to escape from the hole, but doesn't have the strength to do so. I rescue the damaged baby and take her inside. She struggles briefly while I place her on her back in a cardboard box in the kitchen. With her facial cuts disinfected and bandaged, I feed her warm milk from a turkey baster. Within a month or so, she's fully recovered, except for a large scab on her nose. So I release her into the bushes out front, and she rejoins her mother, now reestablished with her family, in the other half of the elm tree. So much for learning from history. During the winter, I do my reading indoors, so I see very little of the family, except for Mom hopping through the snow to gather nuts. Spring comes, And one day I'm sitting in the deep grass reading when I feel something on my leg. The squirrel that I rescued climbs up to my jeans and sits on my lap, looking up at me. I gently stroke her gray fur and scarred nose while tears gather in my eyes. Heads up, everyone. Next episode will be a little later than usual. I'll be taking a break for the holidays. Hope everyone has a good one, and I'll see you in the new year on January 18th with another episode. The Compulsive Storyteller is written and narrated by me, Greg Lefebvre, and co-produced with Peter Kokoma, who's also made our theme song. If you enjoyed this week's episode, we'd love your help sharing the show. Please subscribe to The Compulsive Storyteller for free on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And also, if you could leave a review, that would be fantastic. Follow the show on Instagram, at The Compulsive Storyteller, and check out our website for more information at thecompulsivestoryteller.com. Thanks for listening, and if you don't like this one, the next one will be another story. The characters and events portrayed in this podcast are based on my truth, with some names and facts changed for privacy. All conversations and dialogues are based on my best memory, but are not word-for-word recreations.